Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Today's Bible study is entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? Lesson 8. All right, good evening. Welcome to our final installment of our spring Bible study. Thanks for your faithfulness. Thanks for all those who brought food. And for all of us who ate them, we, we love you. Thank you. <laughs> it's been good fellowship. Looking forward to our fall Bible study, which is going to start in September. So we're going to, we skipped the summer just because of summer stuff. And uh, we'll be back in the fall. Not sure what I'm going to be doing in the fall. Appreciate your prayers for me. We'll see what God has for us. But I really have enjoyed this Bible study again. Very much appreciative to Dr. David Jeremiah and his church there in California. And uh, his exhaustive uh, study, I'm, I'm not giving you everything that he says, because he just, man, the guy can preach. But uh, it's, it's been, a, I've enjoyed it, I hope you have, I hope you've learned from it. I think he really hit it uh, right on the head, and has really uh, got some, got his finger on the pulse of a lot of things. I'd recommend his other stuff. I know he has, Joe, you reading a book from him, what was it called? The Sign, no, Signs, 20 Signs, or something like that. The signs. Anyway, I haven't read it, but I, I would think since it's from him, I would say it's probably going to be really, really good. So we're going to be in uh, several places tonight, of course, as we always are. If you'd like to turn to a place we're going to be a little bit later, Revelation 21 is going to be one of those places. So uh, again, thank you so much for your faithfulness, and uh, we're going to ask God just to bless our time as always. God, we thank you uh, for these eight studies that we've been able to have together. We thank you for the things you've taught us. Thank you, God, that you don't leave us in the dark. Uh, but you lead us into the light. We thank you for servants of yours, like Dr. David Jeremiah, who's faithful to bring your word to your church. And we're thankful for the connectiveness. We talked about how connected we are and how uh, much that can be a huge problem in the world, but there's a huge upside to it. Now we can participate together as your church, learning from the different gifts that you've given to your, your body. And uh, God, we just pray that we would grow as a result of those gifts to be everything you've called us to be in this place, faithful here, Faithful to you, faithful at our jobs, faithful wherever we are, at our school, or anything else in places of influence. Thank you, God. Uh, we pray you let these, these words and these teachings settle deep in our hearts. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. May 14, 2018, there was a large crowd that was assembled in front of a new American assemb uh, embassy in Jerusalem. We got to go there six months later. We went there when we were on our tour of Israel. We got to go there and take a picture. But for the first time since the creation of the modern Israel, the American embassy, which has been promised, which has been talked about, which has been trolled and everything else, uh, finally got moved uh, to Jerusalem. A celebration coincided with Israel's 70th birthday. And uh, after 70 years of vacillation, the United States actually moved off dead center and got it done. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the premier at that time, said, remember this day? What a glorious moment for Israel. This is history, he said. Indeed, he is truthful about that. He really is. Massive history, the fact that it's recognized by one, if not the most powerful nation in the world uh, today, which is the United States. So since that emboldened move by the United States, many other nations have also capitulated. They've done the same thing. Nobody wanted to be the first one. Uh, there were already some actually smaller, smaller nations that were represented there, their embassies represented there. But uh, most people didn't want to do it because they want, didn't want to be the one to start, as everybody said, World War III, because that's what they thought would happen. Well, here we are. That was 2018. We, nothing happened. But everybody was afraid that it would. And why would such a deep, uh, why would there be such deep emotions about a relatively mediocre city? Uh, when you, I'm going I'm to play it up to you today. You're going to want to go. But I will tell you this. When you go, you will get there and say, this place? This place, all the scriptures, all these things, all these massive prophecies, all this incredible history about this place, and the answer is yes. It's not impressive just to see it. You knew nothing about it. You would not, probably never go back. Mediocre-sized city, no seaport, no airport, no natural resources, unless limestone is a natural resource. Uh, not strategic, militarily speaking, uh, particularly strategic, uh, not particularly beautiful, or majestic. Why this place? Why would World War III start over? I mean, we move embassies all the time. People don't. We don't even know about it. Move it to it, move it to Jerusalem, though. Oh boy, look out! So much love and so much hatred come together in one place. And one of the reasons why this is such an embattled place because there's so many predictions about it from so many different religions, and almost 100% of them conflict. 
And it's these conflicts that put Jerusalem in such an incredibly important place. It's been, it's been on the move, if you will. Uh, separated, it was, it was uh, Israel, of course, obtained their statehood in, ni- in May of, two- of 1948. Uh, they conquered half, more or less, of Jerusalem. And then after that, there was a DMZ, a demilitarized zone through the middle of Jerusalem for 19 years, from 1948 to 1967, the year I was born. And then uh, the Six-Day War, Israel captured all of Jerusalem. They united all, all of Jerusalem, took down the DMZ. And ever since then, it's been under, under their possession. Uh, it's been the rec- now the recognized capital of the Jews internationally. And this place is headed somewhere, definitely. It's not the last you're going to be hearing of this. In fact, I want to make sure it's on your radar for sure, because it is key to understanding what God is doing, because this, this place is destined to be the final stage, or the stage of God's final drama, where he changes the whole world order and establishes his son as king. This is the most important city on the planet, Jerusalem. Pay attention to Jerusalem. This city is controversial on many levels. Number one, it is a sacred city, sacred to us as Christians. Why? Well, let's, let's go over a few things. Jesus was crucified there. That's pretty significant. Resurrected there. That's pretty significant. He ascended to heaven from there, and the scripture says he will descend to earth there. When he started his church, where was it? Where did the Holy Spirit come? Jerusalem. This, this is our city. This is the city of Christianity. It's also the city of the Jews. It is, very, of course, very sacred to them in, in so many ways. The line of David ruled there. Their temple was, was built there. Abraham attempted to sacrifice his only son there. And because of his willingness to do that, God established his covenant with Israel. This is a very sacred and sacred and significant city for them. It's also the city of their Messiah. Remember, their Messiah, who is also our Messiah, is Jewish. So it wasn't like Jesus died and resurrected an American. He died as a Jew. And today, our theology, it's very good biblical theology, is there is a man standing at the right hand of God, and his name is Jesus, and he is Jewish. He is coming back to rule as the Jewish king over all, all nations. So this city is going to be his place. Pay attention to the city. It's sacred to the Christians. It's sacred to the Jews. It's also sacred to the Muslims. And of course, Mecca is their most sacred city. But the most important city to them is not Mecca. The actual most important city is Jerusalem, and that's because of their theology. They've been taught by their false theology that uh, the Muslims are now the third chosen people of God. God first, in their theology, first told the, chose the Jews, then he rejected them, then he chose the Christians, and then he rejected them, and then he chose the Muslims. And the way that they've known that they're the chosen people of God is that they've had possession over the sacred city of God for the past, you know, thousand years. Now, not no more. So you think they're going to sit around with their arms folded and say, oh, well, no big deal. We'll just let the Christians and the Jews have that city? Think again. See, they either have to say that their theology is debunked, or they have to die proving that they're the chosen people of God. Which one, which one have they chosen? You know the answer to that question. That's what they're doing. So, so this whole issue that you hear all the time, you know, land for peace, and Israel, if they'll, if they'll make peace with the, with the Muslims, the Muslims do this. Total bunk. It's total bunk. They will only settle for one thing, that Israel is not in the land or not in Jerusalem, period. Not one Jew there at all. That, of course, is not going to happen. So there will always be war uh, between the two of these. Uh, Significant to the Muslims also because, according to the Muslims' theology, their Messiah, their Messiah, is coming back to reign in Jerusalem. He's called the Mahadi. The Mahadi is their miracle-working supernatural. He fits all the criteria, by the way, for the Antichrist. This miracle-working, supernatural uh, uh, Messiah that is to come. He will rule the world from Jerusalem after their version of Jesus comes back and converts the world to Islam. They believe in Jesus, just not your Jesus, not the biblical Jesus. They believe in a Jesus who is Islamic. And that Jesus is going to come back. By the way, I have an image off of their website, the Mahadi website. Here you go. There's the Mahadi right in the middle with the Standard Muslim armor on the big drawn silver, you know, uh, supernatural sword to his right. You recognize him? That's Jesus, their version. 
This Jesus is a warrior Jesus. He's going to come back and convert the world either by sword or by word. You get the choice to choose. He's going to first convert according to their theology, the Jews first, and then the Christians, and then everyone else who is of lesser religions, they're going to have the opportunity to convert. And when they don't, or if they don't, then these armies are going to wipe them out. And of course, um, that's what they believe. And then this, this, this Jesus, their version of Jesus, is going to hand over the, the power and authority over to the Makadi, and he's going to be ruling the world, not from Mecca, but from Jerusalem. Here's his title, the awaited savior of the world, Imam Muhammad al-Makadi. That's him. Watch out for him. Um, they're not messing around. The theology is very serious. In case you hadn't noticed, they're pretty serious about what they believe. So back to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is mentioned only 811 times in the scriptures, which is, you may say, well, that's not a lot. But if you compare it to the next most mentioned city, which is, can you guess which one? 285 times this city was mentioned. You know which one it is? A dollar for whoever can get it, huh? Babylon, you got it. It also is significant to the end times. A dollar, remind me, I'll give you a dollar. I have a dollar and where's Chuck? No, no where's, where's, uh, where's Doug? I have a dollar and pennies because Doug gave me a dollar and pennies today. Dollar and pennies coming for you. So Jerusalem eight minute, mentioned 800 times, like I said, compared to 280 something times for the next most mentioned city in the scriptures. Uh, once you get to the book of Revelation, it is no longer called Jerusalem. It's just simply, or to, to, at some points, it's just simply called the city. It's assumed that you know if God mentions it, he's not talking about New York, he's not talking about Port Isabel, he's not talking about Paris, he's not talking about Berlin or Moscow, he's talking about the city. There's only one city in the mind of God, and it is Jerusalem, to be sure. All cities, mark this carefully, are, are slated for demolition, except for Jerusalem. So if you're, if, you're, if you're willing to go long on some stocks, buy stocks really long. It may, may be long, maybe not long, I don't know. If you want to go long, though, Jerusalem is the spot. Almost everywhere you turn today, there's something being said about this city. It is, to be certain, God's city. It's his city. Not to say that God isn't present, doesn't care about other cities, but this city in particular is his. The Bible tells us, that there is a special blessing for several things. Let's, let's turn, turn to Psalm 87. Have you, ever, have you ever read this psalm? I'm sure you have. Or if you haven't, here we go. It's very short, very sweet, and very interesting. Psalm 87 has a special blessing, unlike any other city, for those who were born in Jerusalem. Psalm 87, verse 1, his foundation is, the, is in the holy mountains. The Lord loves the gates of Zion. Of course, that's Jerusalem. More than all the other dwellings of the places of Jacob, glorious things are spoken of you, O city of God. I shall uh, mention Rahab and Babylon among those who, knew, who know me. Behold, Philistia and Tyre and Ethiopia. This one was born there. That's a quote from somewhere else. But, at, uh, but of Zion it shall be said, this one, and it shall be said, this one and that one were born in her, and the Most High himself will establish her, and the Lord shall count when he registers the people, this one was born there. Then those who sing as well as those who play the flute shall say, all my springs of joy are in you. This one, there's something special about being born uh, in this city. There's a blessing for those who are born there, a blessing for those who pray for Jerusalem. You've seen this one, right? Psalm 122 commanded to pray. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, which is really strange because the name Jerusalem means, it, literal, the literal statement, it makes, it's a statement actually in, in Hebrew. In it there is peace. In it there is peace. And if, if you've noticed, Jerusalem doesn't have, if any place doesn't have peace, it's certainly Jerusalem. So it's a strange name. Pray for the peace of a place that has peace. It's, it's strange. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. This is recommended for Jews and Gentiles. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We're going to revisit that here a little bit later. Jesus, of course, loves Jerusalem. And on one occasion, he stood overlooking the city and wept over it. Here's what he said. Jerusalem. There are no other city, does he say this about. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Weeps 
over this city. So it is a sacred city. Number two, it is a central city. The city was, has captured the world's attention like no other city has. Uh, Ezekiel 5.5 5 is very interesting. The, the contrivance of the Hebrew here is very, very interesting. I'm trying to explain it to you. But, but here it is just in our English version. Thus says the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set her in the midst of the nations, it's literally the center. But it's, uh, it's, like I said, it's an interesting word. In the midst of the nations and the countries all around her. That word in Hebrew for midst is not your typical word to say that you were in the middle. It literally means put your finger in your belly button, everybody. Go ahead. Do you have a belly button? Or were you born under a... Okay, that's the word. I, that's a literal word that God uses. I have made her the belly button of the world. What a name. That's the middle. Where, where, what is a belly button for? It shows what? This is Mother's Day. It shows where you and your mom were connected. It's where you got life from. So the, the navel, the umbilical cord of the world connects here. It connects right here. You think about it. What umbilical cord brings life to a baby? Where do we get life from? Where did Jesus, where was death defeated? The city. This is a significant city. In fact, no way to overstate it, I don't believe. Jesus himself defeated death there, rose again. He is the life himself and will rule in that city. As much as God loves this city, Satan also hates this city. The city has been so embattled, it's been conquered and overthrown dozens of times. It's still yet to be uh, at least one more time. Uh, the Holy Spirit, of course, descended in, in this city, in Jerusalem. His destiny is tied. The destiny of the world is tied to this city, uh, definitely. It is a central city. It is a chosen city. It was chosen by God to be the place of his major work. Of course, Jesus dies there. He resurrects there. Holy Spirit descends there. The church was born there. The mission of the church started there. Jesus will return there. Uh, in 1 Kings chapter 8, Deuteronomy 12, God, five different times, God says, this is the city that he's chosen. This is my city, he says. No other city like it. Here's another place in 1 Chronicles chapter 6. Since the day I brought you, my people, out of the land of Egypt, I have chosen no city from any tribe of Israel in which to build a house, that my name might be there, nor did I choose any man to be a ruler over my people, Israel. Yet I have chosen Jerusalem, that my name might be there, and I have chosen David to be over my people, Israel. It is God's chosen city. He's got to choose, he's got to choose a place, right, or create another one. He hasn't, he's not going to create another one. Oh, he's going to create another Jerusalem, but... Uh, he, he has chosen the city of Jerusalem. So always, since all the tensions, because this, this place is like a powder keg, like I said, the very interesting name. In it, there is peace, and yet there's never been hardly anything but peace uh, in this city. But it's the powder keg of the entire earth. It is the most armed city in the world. You think Texas is armed, go to Jerusalem. Everybody has got a hand on a gun there. You got a little rabbi with his beard and his little dreadlocks, you know, at the wailing wall, and his prayer shawl is hung up on a Glock stuck in the back of his belt. you got beautiful 18-year-old girls standing in green uniforms with 90 rounds of M16 ammunition on them and an M16 in their hands, loaded, locked and loaded. Street corners. I mean, this place is armed, very armed. They have to be uh, because they are effectively always constantly at war. Uh, there are places even... With all the war and demolition, when you go there, there are places, though, that when you go, you know that you're standing in the exact spot where Jesus was. There are spots that you can go there where you know he, where he performed certain miracles. I mean, you're, you're, not just, you're not in a facsimile thereof. You're on the spot. Uh, because uh, the Jews conquered in 1967, they've done lots of excavations, and in some places they've excavated the streets down to the first century streets. So you're walking on the same stones, to be certain that Jesus and the disciples walked on. Of course, you go over to, to, to the Mount of Olives, you're on the same place where Jesus was arrested, where he ascended. Uh, you go over to Golgotha, it's still there. You stand right in front of the place called the Skull, the exact spot where Jesus was crucified. Right around the corner, right behind it, is the, the tomb which they laid. He was only there three days, but he was there. Uh, it's all there. And so when you're there, you're just like, it's overwhelming. For me, it certainly is. Uh, you can see uh, the places where Jesus did all these things. I've spent the majority of my life teaching the Bible and preaching the Scriptures. But when you go to Jerusalem, when you go to Israel, it's like you're jumping through the pages. You'll never see the Bible the same ever again. Jerusalem especially. You just stand there realizing you're in the midst of so much prophecy and so much history. 
uh, you're walking in God's city, and it is destined for exaltation. So Jerusalem is a central city, it is a sacred city, it is a capital city. It became, of course, the capital of the Jews 3,000 years ago when David declared it, conquered it, and declared it as his capital. and became the capital because God chose, of course, the city. Uh, other nations have conquered it over the years, and they settled there, but nonetheless, there's always been a Jewish contingency that lived there. For decades, our own government was, I mean, literally decades, drugged their feet, but said that they were going to move their embassy there. It wasn't just the Bushes, it wasn't just... Ronald Reagan, it was before that, the 60s, even the 50s, not long after Israel became um, uh, its own country. We promised that we're going to do it. In fact, they met, we made a resolution, our congressman did in 1995, that they were going to make sure that our embassy was moved to Jerusalem by the end of the millennium. Well, 2000 came and went. We didn't do anything. So it wasn't until 2017 that the Senate voted, after Trump became president, the Senate voted to, to honor the resolution of 1995, and they told Trump to get it done. Six months later, they did it. They've got it there. And this event literally has been a critical key in a grand lock of biblical prophecy. The focus of the world has to go to Jerusalem. It can't be Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv has been the center or considered the, the capital of Israel, not, not Jerusalem. It can't be that. It has to be Jerusalem. Again, these things are coming together. So what does this mean? Well, very simply, the second coming of Jesus cannot happen Without Jerusalem, it can't. You, I would encourage you, you're, you'll find it interesting to read the good Bible teachers who taught 100 years ago. Read their commentaries. They can't imagine Jews living in Jerusalem. They can't imagine the Jews having a military. They can't imagine the Jews having, having control of the Temple Mount. They can't imagine it. Now, they, you'll read, read these guys, and they're writing, and they're saying, listen, we believe it's going to happen. But it's beyond our imagination how it would ever happen because there's just the Jews have no power and the, 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 the Muslim contingency here is very, very strong. And so now here we are, 100 years later, and can we imagine it? Oh, boy. Boy, can we. We really can. These prophecies that are about, that are about Christ and about the city of Jerusalem assume a continual existence. Like I said, if you're going to bet on a city, this is your city. You're going to go long on a stock, go, on the, go long on the stock of Jerusalem because they're the ones. Uh, when we go, and I want you to go, you need to go. What are you going to do with that money anyway? You're going to throw it away on something ridiculous like food or rent or something. <laughs> go, blow it, live off ramen noodles for a couple of years. You're gonna, it'll be, you'll be fine. When, we, when you go with us and you stand on the southern te steps of the temple facing south, you're facing downhill just 150 yards from where David's uh, palace was and Solomon's palace was, and then down from that, the old the original city, the, fort the, the fortress city of, of Jerusalem. Off to your left is the Mount of Olives, which is where Jesus is going to return. I mean, you're just right there. You're just right in the hub, right in the middle of, of all these things. It's just such a glorious place to be. The entire earth, the Scripture says, is going to return to this city, and Jesus, when he, Jesus descends and conquers and they're going to be traveling here uh, to meet with the king. Earthly Jerusalem, though, is only a prelude to the coming Jerusalem. The coming Jerusalem, this is just a uh, holdover to the ultimate Jerusalem that's going to be for all ages when God creates a new Jerusalem that is now in heaven and is going to be descending to the earth. Let's, you're in Revelation. I ask you to turn there, right? But maybe you left it to go to Psalms. But let's go back to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21 tells us about this new Jerusalem that is in heaven now, but will not remain in heaven. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 3, and I, 3, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, John says, where the first heaven and the first earth passed away. Don't go long on that. And there is no longer any sea. And I began... I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Coming down from where? Up there to down here. God's going to come and live with us. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. Never been there before. And he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. This is not an ethereal... Uh, 
uh, whimsical thing. It's not a, a symbolic thing. It's a literal city. Scripture says that you and I are going to resurrect, so I'm currently physical and I'm going to die and be non-physical for a while, and then I'm going to be resurrected back into, back into me. So I hope you like you because you're not going to be me and I'm not going to be you. You're going to get to be you forever. Physical you. Physical you is going to have to live in a physical place. We're not existing in eternity floating around playing harps on, on some clouds somewhere. I don't know where we got that imagery from, but it's certainly not from the scriptures. We're going to be living in a physical place. That's this City, resurrected, never to die again. We're headed to this place. Let's keep reading here in verses 4 and 5. And he shall wipe away the conditions of the city. Wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall no longer be any death. And they shall, uh, no long, they shall no longer be any, there shall no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. He who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write for these words are faithful and true. He goes on to say. So this new Jerusalem will be overwhelmingly beautiful. So different than any world, anything we've experienced in this life. Of course, streets paved with gold. Uh, no, no light uh, because the sun, there won't be any need for the sun or the moon because the, the this, the light coming through the throne of God and the throne of His Son will radiate the whole place. The tree of life which has been missing since the Garden of Eden will be in the center of the city. We'll be eating from this tree, it says. The river of life will flow out from under the throne of God from the heart of the city and replenish the entire earth. It will be a holy city. You've never been in a city like that. It'll be a holy place. You've never been in a place like that. No evil. None. There will be no lie ever uttered there. No death will ever occur there. No evil word or thought will come out there. No shady deal will ever be discussed there. No corruption of any kind on any level will ever be there. You and I cannot imagine a place like that. It does not exist on earth. It does not. This city that God is creating for us. And John lists, by the way, if you'll go down there a couple more verses, John lists eight kinds of people that will not be there. These kind of people dominate our world today. But they will not be here in this holy city. Look at verse 8. The cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. They will not be in the city. It will totally, radically change who we are, what we are, what our experiences are. It will be an absolutely amazing place. It is there, uh, unlike any place we've ever been in today, to be sure. No degeneration of any kind, no curse of sin, nothing at all. It will be the Savior City, uh, designed and occupied by the one who built it for us. Remember what he promised us uh, back in John, chapter 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me, my Father's house. What is that? New Jerusalem. There are many mansions or dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. It's where God lives. It's, where, it's in heaven today, but it's not going to stay there. It's coming down to be with us. It is the Savior city created by Jesus uniquely for those who are going to be there. And the most important part of the city, actually, people talk about the gold and the jewels and how gorgeous it's going to be. I don't think those things are going to be as big a deal as we think they are. I think the real issue of this city is going to be the people that are going to be there. In particular, God is going to be there. When we see God, when we see His Son, the experience that we have there is going to be such an amazing experience to be with people who don't sin anymore, don't think about sin. Don't have the capacity to sin. Imagine what that was going to be like. Val and I learned a real important lesson about how people can change or how, how much people are important to a community. Uh, we moved, or I took a position as a pastor in a little church, I told you this morning, Trinity Baptist Church, Miranda City, Texas, 1993. We moved there in this fall of 1993 when our son was three weeks old. And uh, I remember, um, I don't know if you've ever been to Webb County, Texas, but this, it makes... It makes Cameron County look like the Garden of Eden. <laughs> it's just a desert. Uh, it's the middle of nowhere. I remember when we drove into the town, Valerie uh, broke down in tears. 
Because it just wasn't, you know, it wasn't our idea of where God would call us. I mean, I don't know what our idea was, but we were raised in East Texas with trees and woods and rain and, I don't know, people who spoke our language and other things. And so it's kind of the idea of what we thought would be, but it's not what God had, had for us. And so as we drove through the city, you know, she breaks down in tears, but nonetheless, it was, it was the place that God called us to be, and we dedicated our lives to this place. And this is the city was like. Uh, you go to Laguna Heights, go to the worst, worst part of Laguna Heights, the whole city is like that. Rundown houses, uh, uh, abandoned buildings, uh, abandoned oil-filled equipment with grass growing up in it. Uh, the first May that we were there, it reached 112 degrees. Uh, May, we're not even August yet. Um, uh, everything's brown, everything's dead. Uh, people hide until about 9 o'clock at night when it cools down, they come out and walk around. Uh, just a very different place. Uh, the name of the town was, is in Spanish, Mirando, which means to view something. There's nothing to view there. <laughs> to this day, you go there and you would, it would be very forgetful, I would just simply say that. Not a pretty place at all. But we invested our lives there. God called us there. Uh, we served there for eight years, and we absolutely loved it. God blessed us with two more kids while we lived there. And we loved it. And the reason why we loved it is because of the people. The people were so good to us. Uh, they were so encouraging. They were so helpful. I'm not, and, and people in the church especially, but the people just in the community, they were respectful. Every person in that town called me sir because I was the pastor. Drug dealers, I knew them. They sent their kids to our church, called me sir. I could watch them do drug deals, and then they'd call me sir. Uh, they were respectful. It was conservative. It was just, just the people made the difference. So, so is heaven going to be a great place because we have streets of gold and because there's going to be jewels and diamonds? Yeah, 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 yeah. The people, guys, is going to make all the difference. Because you know for a fact people ruin places, don't they? There, there are some places in this world that I would love to go to, but I will not, at least and my wife will probably make me go, but I don't want to go. The whole state of California, I don't, mm-mm. Not interested. Now, there's probably great people there. In fact, no doubt there is. But just something about it. The people have ruined a gorgeous place. There's cities that I just, uh-uh. I don't want to go. Because why? The people. They ruin it. We ruin it. Even the best places get ruined by people because we're sinners. Sinners mess stuff up. Heaven and the ultimate end of Jerusalem is not going to be like that at all. The facts of the majesty of New Jerusalem will be small compared to the people that are going to be there. Look at uh, chapter 22, verse 4. Revelation, verse 4. See, this is going to be the most important part of it. All right, let's go to verse 3. There shall no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his bondservants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. That's going to be the most important part about this place. It's going to make, uh, the gold is going to matter, I guess. The jewel is going to matter, I guess. But the people and ultimately the God is going to be there is going to make all the difference in the world. So, so where do we go from here about Jerusalem? What do we do with it? Such an important city. Well, number one, we need to encourage or be encouraged to stay in prayer for this city. Of course, we've been told already, Psalm 122, to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That's a commandment. It's a commandment. There's a blessing, the Scripture says, for those who pray, who love Jerusalem, who, who promote the welfare of the Jewish people, the city is full of animosity, of differing views, of passionate beliefs, uh, uh, millennia-old uh, uh, prejudices, religious differences. Uh, I remember several years back on Easter Sunday, they were reporting that the, the, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is supposedly the place where Jesus was crucified and buried and resurrected inside this area where this church was built, uh, the, the Catholic priest and the Orthodox priest and, and one other, I think it's the Eastern Orthodox, all share the one building. And so especially on special occasions like Easter, they have to, they have to you know, you have it the 9 o'clock service, we have the 10 o'clock service, and then, you know, the Catholics have the 11 o'clock service or whatever. But there was a mix-up on which denomination had which time, and they got in a fight. You know, when they, when they march in, they have all their vestal robes and all their stuff, and they have these big poles, these standard poles with a flag at the top with the metal. They were whacking each other with that. So... Even under the auspices of the name Christian, which I don't necessarily call, consider that to be, you have this, such animosity. Only Jesus, the Prince of Peace, will be able to bring peace to the city of peace. In modern Israel, you walk through there, you can feel the tension. 
You've not been in a place, maybe, maybe I don't know, some bad places in D.C. back there, Doug, but I've never been in a place where you can just literally feel, like I said, you're walking on a powder keg. That's the truth. I'm not trying to keep you from going. I mean, you've got to die somehow. You ought to die there. Uh, but I don't think you will. I, you feel safe there, uh, even albeit all, all things given uh, the way that they are. Modern Israel and Jerusalem in particular is in constant state of war. Someone described living in, in Jerusalem as living in a really nice house in a very bad neighborhood. And that's a good description. Animosity growing all course at, at all times all around us in our own nation. Animosity is increasing. It, it has to. Uh, of course, we need to vote against it. We need to vote out those who are that way. We need to speak out against it. Nonetheless, I'm not trying to be a fatalist. I'm just simply saying it has to do that. We have to, Israel has to be isolated. As long as we're their allies, uh, that's not going to happen. I'm all in favor of Israel being an ally. Don't, don't get me wrong. But it has to go to the place where Israel is, is, has no allies anymore. Uh, it is frightening uh, when I watch our nation turn away from it because, as we know, God has promised the blessings upon those who bless Israel and a curse upon those who curse. So as our nation turns away from being a blessing to Israel, we're uh, hurting ourselves to be sure. Of course, Russia and her, uh, the, her ilk are going to be marching on Israel before too long. Uh, the wrath of the Antichrist is going to be against them. He's going to be deporting everyone in Israel and Jerusalem in particular. So, so these are, there's lots of bad stuff that's got to happen in this city, but the city itself never going to fall. Here's some, just to give you an idea of how things are going uh, internationally right now, statistics from the United Nations. Uh, Israel has been singled out effectively as the most discriminated against state in the world. So, so in the past, from 2012 to 2019, the UN made 202 resolutions criticizing different, different things that they disagreed with. Of the 202 uh, resolutions, 163 resolutions were against the state of Israel. So they were responsible, think about it, for 81%, and from 2012 to 2019, they were responsible for 81% of the bad stuff that happened on our planet? No. They're being singled out. Little, we're talking about 9 million people. So they were singled out ahead of atrocities like were committed in Russia or China or Venezuela or Iran or Libya or Syria during the same amount of time. No resolution, hardly any resolutions from the United Nations against those groups of people. But anytime Israel sneezes, resolution. They're not allowed to sneeze on sacred days or whatever. Who knows what they'll say. This is very much in line with what the Scripture says is going to happen. You're in Revelation 21. Let's go to Revelation 12. The hatred is truly diabolical. I mean, truly, the devil is behind it. And we get an indication of that here in Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 6, and then skipping down to verse 17. A great sign, so that means it's not literal, right? That's right. These are not literal, these are signs. And when the Scripture says... Otherwise, when Revelation says, if it doesn't say it's a sign, then don't take it as a sign. Take it literally. So don't try to make it say what it doesn't say. People want to go through the Revelation and make them all signs or whatever. Like, unless it says it is, it ain't. But let it be what it is. So in this case, this is a sign. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman. Now, how do we know this is not a woman? Because it said it's a sign, right? <laughs> let it be what it is. So it's not actually a woman. It's a sign. It's a, she represents something. A woman clothed with the sun and moon under her feet, and on her head were the crown of 12 stars. This is Israel, by the way. I'm not going to take time to explain it to you, but uh, it is. And she was with child, so she's bringing someone into the world. And she cried, being in labor and in pain to give birth, and another sign, so this is not literal, this is figurative, this is not what he looks like, but it, it represents him. Great sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns on his head. This is the devil. It's not what he looks like. But it tells us it's a sign. And on his head seven diadems, and his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven. And he threw them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman, who's Israel, who was about to give birth, and so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. Who is her child? It's going to tell us. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule over the nations. Uh-oh, I know who that is. With a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne up there. The woman, remember, who is Israel, fled into the wilderness, it's always east for the Jews, where she had a place prepared for her by God that there would be, she would be nursed there 1,000, 
260 days. Look at verse 17. I wrote it in my notes, but I can't remember why I wrote that. But anyway, take a look at it. The dragon was enraged. Here we go. With the woman. Who's the dragon? The devil. Who's the woman? Israel. He hates her. Despises her city. He went off to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimonies of Hold to the testimony of Jesus. The hatred there is truly diabolical. You can see it. Who controls the world today? Not God. Of course, God's sovereign, but he's given control to Satan. And so it's not surprising that he hates the city and hates the Jews and using things like the UN to his own uh, ends. So, so number one, I encourage you to stay fervent in prayer for Israel. Number two, stay faithful to your service of ministry. So as we see Things ramping up for Jerusalem, what does that tell us? It's getting close, ladies and gentlemen. We need to get busy. Time is short, right? 2 Peter 3.11 Therefore, since all things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Since you know how it's going to end, and it's getting close, not time to mess around. Not time for me to walk in my sin and other things. Time for me to disavow those things in my life and walk in, in the things that God has called me to do. Never been a more important time for us to refuse to live lives that are a lie and to start living lives according to the will of God. Again, as things get darker, we need to shine brighter. So, so stay faithful to service and ministry. And then a third thing. So, so encourage you to pray. Encourage you to stay faithful. Encourage you to stay focused on Israel and Jerusalem. And most don't see the massive moves that God is happening around. Like I said, you listen to the news and they act like they don't know anything because they don't. Because unless you know the scriptures, unless you follow the Holy Spirit, you will not know the truth. They will say anything except the truth. And I found it interesting when my mom had uh, Alzheimer's, one of the things, the effects of Alzheimer's to her, this is my mom's day, and she got Alzheimer's young, early onset, 57 years old. Uh, she was diagnosed at 70. but I mean, diagnosed at 60 and died at 70. But one of the things, if, if you asked her to do something, she would do anything but that. Like there was a panel of switches on my parents' wall in the living room. There's four switches, one for the middle light in the living room, one for the, you know, one on this end is for that, for that side, and one on this end for that side, and this one right here is for over the fireplace. And my dad said, I can tell her, Bill, literally to, to hit the one on the right, and she would go hit the one on the left. She can't do it. He said, if you tell her to hit the one, no, the other one, she still goes to that one. You mean this one? No, that was the one you just turned off. She couldn't, it, it, would, it wouldn't register, it wouldn't work for her. So he learned to say, he would say the opposite of what he meant, and she would turn on the right light. But anyway, it, it's almost like the same thing with our world. Our world has Alzheimer's. They can't, they, they can't think correctly, and they're, they're easily led astray, and that's where they are. They, they cannot reason through, they can't see beyond uh, their disease, their spiritual disease and, and, and delusion that they're under. So stay focused on Israel and Jerusalem. I mean, let me run down the, the timeline for you. So 2,000 years, Israel's out of the land. Prior to that, 600 years, they're effectively not sovereign over Jerusalem. They're controlled by the Greeks. They're controlled by the Romans. They're controlled by the Persians. They're controlled by the Babylonians. They're controlled. So for 600 years before Christ, they're, they're not sovereign over Jerusalem. But since 1948, Israel's been back in the land. And since 1967, they've been sovereign over Jerusalem. 2,600 years, they reinvent themselves? Where has that ever happened? After 2,600 years, they reinvent their nation, they reinvent their government, they reinvent their language, they reinvent, uh, they control the city, they control the Temple Mount, or their fathers after 2,600 year hiatus, that has never happened before. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a massive sign. And like I said, if you can't see that one, I mean, you, you have Alzheimer's, spiritual Alzheimer's. That one is huge. Again, the real news is that these people have reinvented themselves, their language, uh, their people. They've been on hiatus for 2,600 years, and they're back. Israel ranks seventh most mentioned country in the world, according to the New York Times. That's just behind uh, Russia and England and Germany. These are massive nations. They control all kinds of wealth and power, and yet Israel... Is the seventh most mentioned in the New York Times? Why is that? Why are they becoming the focus of the world? Israel has the tenth most powerful military in the world, even though they're a tiny, tiny, small little nation. Literally the entire world is becoming solvent over Israel in general and Jerusalem in particular. And I want to show you why, because God predicted that it would happen 
and then we're going to be done. Zechariah chapter 12. You would turn there with me. Zechariah chapter 12. Why is the world so skewed about Israel and Jerusalem in particular? Because God predicted that it would be that way. Here's what he says. Zechariah chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. The burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel, the prophecy, the prediction of God concerning Israel. Thus declares the Lord, who stretches out the heavens and lays the foundation of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. He's just trying to say, listen, I know what I'm talking about. Listen to me. Behold, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling to all the peoples around. And when the siege is against Jerusalem, it will also be against Judah. And it will come about that in that day, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples, every country, United States included, and all who lift it will be severely injured, and all the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. She will be isolated, she will be embattled, and she will win. She will not be destroyed. So why is the world focused, and why is it so, why is the UN so skewed and, and uh, you know, mentally deranged about Jerusalem? Because God said, God said that they would be. So we're seeing this. I said, if, if you would just get some of my commentaries and read these old guys just 100 years ago, how they just can't imagine how these kind of things are happening. Here we are, ladies and gentlemen. We're seeing this stuff. We are right at it. Now, things, can things continue to go? Yes. Can, can the market turn and things go south really fast over there? Yes. Everything is together. It's, it's right together. So we need to be careful who we are. We need to be careful to remember the Jews in Jerusalem. Be careful uh, to be faithful to the ministry that we have because the time truly, it truly is short. You want to know what's happening, what God's doing? Pay attention to this city. Pay attention. Don't be afraid to go either. Go. You should go. If you haven't been, you need to see this place. But like I said, word of warning, you will say, this place, this place, but when you stand there, you're standing on so much history and so much prophecy. You've not been in a place like You will not go to another place uh, like this town. It is amazing. So we'll stop right there. Questions? You forgot your question? <laughs> it was a good one. Too. Okay. Keep thinking. My question was, God is going to make David ruler over? Yes, he is. With David's past history? Yes. Yeah. So Tom is asking the question, how is, how is David, the line of David, ruled? But actually the Bible says God's going to resurrect David and put him, put him back in charge of Jerusalem. So that's, that's in Jeremiah. That's in uh, Ezekiel. So Tom has a problem with the fact that why would you put a sinner in Because he's letting you in, Tom. That's all I have to say to you. <laughs> he's letting you in. So, you know, and, and yeah, David, David is a tremendous example of God's grace and mercy and desire and willingness to forgive. And how can it be a man after God's own heart having done the things that he did? Well, uh, because God is able to fix us that good. So, uh, yes, you do. So do I. Something else. Brian, you got a question? Or a comment, or maybe yeah. a question. Well, will the Antichrist be a Muslim? Uh, you know, I would have said, and I'm, all, I'm in a process, you know, especially when it comes to, to prophecies, kind of like, whew. If you're asking me, are you asking my opinion? Yeah. I'm leaning that way. I'm, I'm, I'm leaning that way the more I understand Muslim theology and the more I can't wrap my mind around the fact, because I try to, I try to understand things from a, from a biblical perspective and from, a, from a, uh, a position of God's sovereign. So God is sovereign. Why is he allowing this group of people to become more and more dominant? I don't understand it. Why? Because uh, obviously Satan, Satan gets to, Satan's ruling the earth, but Satan doesn't get to do anything without permission. So why is Satan permitted to push 
these groups. In fact, I scratched my head really hard because when I moved here in 2001, I hadn't been here uh, four months, and uh, we had the, the uh, 9-11. I mean, we were, um, we were very much against the Muslims at that time, and now we have at least, at least two U.S. congressmen who are Muslims, and they're, not, they're, not, uh, they're radical Muslims. Listen to them. How, how is that possible? It's, it, it, it would be like, you know, you think of an example. You left your doors unlocked, and so someone broke in and stole all your stuff last week, and this week you come to your house and your doors are still unlocked. What? What in the world is wrong with you? Something's not right with you. I mean, you're not thinking right, because I, I would think for sure once something like this has happened, there would be a long time before you ever unlock the doors. But for us, we unlock the doors really quickly here. Something is making that happen. I mean, on a spiritual level. Something is happening. So, so I, I'm, I'm leaning more towards that. Yes, I am. Of course, they, they predict it. Their, their, their Machadi is, is definitely, the, if, if he comes, he's definitely the Antichrist. If it actually works out that way. Because the way they describe him, he's, every, I mean, he's a miracle worker. Uh, he's going to have all the power of Allah. He's going to do all this stuff. Jesus is going to be his right-hand henchman. He's going to promote the, his work. We're going to be all worshiping him along with Allah and, and Mahdi, and Jesus is going to be the one who promotes the worship of both of these, just like the false prophet does, Revelation 13. So I, I'm leaning that way. When it doesn't happen, I'll, you know, I'll let you know I was off on that. But I, I mean, until recently, when I started looking at what they believe, I didn't, I didn't think that. But like I said, I've been trying to figure out why are the Muslims still even here unless they play a role, because we are certainly near the end. Something else. Think of it. Text me. <laughs> All right. Good to go. Let's, let's pray. God, I thank you that uh, you don't leave us in the dark. I thank you for the great things you're doing today all around us. Give us the eyes to see, the hearts to understand, the willingness to see beyond uh, the, the distractions, the, the things that are thrown in our face and our eyes that say these are important things. These are the things that matter. God, help us not to see those things. Help us to see what you're doing Help us to see what you're doing politically, what you're doing uh, economically, what you're doing in Jerusalem, what you're doing uh, religiously, God. Help us to see these things and put these things together, God. We thank you, uh, again, that you don't leave us in the dark, but that you share with us the things that you're doing. Help us to be, as we see these things, even more faithful to follow you, to be the people that you've called us to be, whether time is short for this earth or just simply short for us, either way. God, we don't have time to, to waste for sure. Thank you, God, for this time again. Our uh, eight sessions this spring, God, we pray as we look forward to this fall and our coming back together on Sunday nights, God, we pray uh, that you would lead in that way. Thank you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.